Okay. Sam's in a hurry, so we better get going. Sorry. All right. So, helix bundles and beta barrels. Uh, so, the initial, from, from a biophatics point of view, the initial problem that was posed in the field was not really to predict the 3D structure of, of uh, membrane proteins from a sequence, but to predict what's called the topology of the membrane protein from sequence. And so the topology is like, in a way, you could say it's it's akin to the two uh, to the secondary structure prediction problem in for soluble proteins, but it takes you a little bit further than secondary prediction does in for soluble proteins. So a topology model for a membrane protein for a helical membrane protein would basically be a, a model something like this, where you try to predict which segments of the protein make up the transmembrane helices. Um, but you don't try to predict the, the arrangement of the helices relative to each other. You just predict where are the helices in the sequence, right? And the second part of the topology model is to say which way is the protein oriented in the membrane? Which parts are on the outside of the cell which are facing the inside of the cell? So that's unique to membrane proteins. You don't have that for soluble proteins. But for membrane proteins, you also have orientation. Which way faces out? which part of the protein faces out, which faces in. So for a topology model, you want to specify where the helix is and which way is the protein oriented in the membrane. That's a topology model. And then you can be more or less restrictive in, in you know, how well you have to predict the starts and ends of the helices. You could say, well, if I get the number of helices right, um, but they may be displaced by five residues up and down, and so then maybe I don't care, I think I'm still happy. Or you could say, I really want to predict precisely where the helical structure ends for each of these helices and where it goes into a loop or a turn comp comp formation or something. But th those are details. So basically, this is what was meant by a topology model. In order to predict, or, or to come up with a predictor, topology predictor, then, uh, it's nice to know some of the basic statistics of how on, on helices and, and orientation. How long are helices typically, what's the distribution length and so on, so you have something to guide you. Um, here is just, this is just done on three proteins, but it's, it, it's pretty similar if you look now when you have a few hundred structures or maybe 500 structures for memory proteins. Uh, so typically what you see is that these transmembrane helices tend to be between 20 and 30 residues long. And 20 is what you would guess from the known thickness of the membrane. So the, the hydrophobic part of the membrane is typically say 30 angstroms wide. And if you make an alpha helix 30 angstroms long to span that hydrophobic core of the membrane, you need about 20 residues. To do that. Each residue advances the, or adds one and a half angstroms to the length of the helix. So that's what you would expect for kind of the short, on the short end, somewhere around 20 or a little bit shorter. Maybe. On the long end, of course, it's, it's, it's less well defined because you can make a very long one, even if it's all hydrophobic, you can just tilt it in the membrane and it will still be buried, right? So uh, that's one reason why these helices go to longer lengths, of course. Also, of course, the helical conformation can extend outside the membrane in some of these helices as well. But then, of course, they won't be hydrophobic anymore, the tails that extend outside. So this is the typical lengths you would expect. Um, you can look more carefully into the amino acid composition across these helices to see if they're all uniform, or if all the hydrophobic residues are uniformly distributed from one end to the other, or if there are you know, variations in where you find different types of residues. And if you do that, the most striking feature is that is tryptophans and tyrosines. I don't know if you remember what all the side chains look like, but tryptophans and tyrosines are aromatic residues, but they also have polar 
polar atoms in, in the aromatic ring structures. So tyrosine, for instance, is a six-membered of, of phenylalanine, essentially, but with an OH group on it. So it has a polar moiety on it as well. And tryptophan is a double ring with an NH group in it, so it has, um, also has a polar part. And they tend, to, both in beta barrels and in, in helical bubble proteins, these tyrosins and tryptophans very clearly are very, very clearly concentrated near the ends of the helices or the beta strands. Those parts of the protein that would be essentially in the lipid head group region. Uh, that's where you find the tryptophans and the tyrosins. And presumably that is because they are on the one hand hydrophobic because they have these aromatic rings, but they also have this polar moiety on it, on them. So they are kind of mediating, they're both like to be up on, on the surface of the membrane, but they also like to be inside the membrane. And so therefore, they're well suited to form the kind of interface residues that are in the lipid head group region, where the hydrophobic membrane turns into a more hydrophilic type of environment. Uh, so if, if you think about the helices themselves, if you have a stretch of hydrophobic residues, and if in addition you find the tryptophan or tyrosine at one or both ends, you'll be even more likely to think that this is probably a transmembrane helix. Okay. Um, <coughs> then, of course, you have loops that connect the helices. Yeah? Um, I don't know if this is from the way that Yeah, no, so, so that is that's a good question if we go back to this. So um, what's shown here is in fact the entire extent of the helical conformation because the 3D structure is known so you can map that out, right? But if you were to, to use the hydrophobic, you know, use to look for the hydrophobic segment that you would think would span the, the core of the membrane, that would actually not extend all the way up here. It would end here somewhere in this particular helix type. So when you do a topology prediction, you can either say, well, I don't really care to predict the precise ends of the helices. All I want to know is what segment is in the membrane. Uh, and that's what most predictors do, actually. But there are predictors nowadays that try to extend these predicted hydrophobic helices to see how far should it, can they be extended before they break into some other type of structure. Right? But that's kind of adding an extra, an extra complexity to the prediction problem. And most of the topology predictors don't do that, so they just focus on predicting the transmembrane <coughs> the parts embedded in the membrane itself, and just get the number of those right, and their approximate locations <coughs> in the sequence. Right? So, um, yeah, so then you have these connecting loops, and of course you can do statistics on them, and it turns out that, that for most proteins, these loops are, in general, very short. You don't have huge, big domains protruding between, you know, connecting to, to transmembrane segments, although it does happen. But generally speaking, so here is one compilation just calculating the distribution of loop lengths across the set set of known structures. And what you can see is that, just look at the, the full line here, is that they tend to be short, you know, 10, 10 residues, 15 residues, a little bit more than you need to just connect directly to the uses, but very short things, not much protruding out of the membrane, actually. Uh, and you, of course you have longer loops, but they're comparatively rare. Right? Um, but then the loops, there is one additional aspect of the loops, which turns out both to be very interesting and also to be very helpful when it turns, in terms of, of making good predictors, topology predictors. And that is that the distribution of residues, in particular the distribution of positively charged residues in the loops is highly biased. And what you find, and this is what I should, add that this is only true for helical proteins, naturally beta viral proteins. So what you find is that 
the loops that end up facing the inside of the facing inside of the cell have quite high frequencies of positively charged residues, whereas the loops that end up end up facing the outside of the cell have very few positively charged residues, especially if the loops are short. There are very few positively charged residues. And since most loops are short, in general, they have very few positive charges on the outside. So here are just some numbers from a collection of bacteria in a member of proteins. That lysine plus arginine frequency is 15, 16% in the loops facing inside, but only a few percent in the loops facing outside. So it's three to four fold higher frequency on the inside than the outside. Likewise for eukaryotic plasma membrane proteins, maybe a two-fold difference. This is one of the membranes in the chloroplast, hydrochloric membrane proteins, same thing, two to three-fold higher frequency on the inside versus the outside facing. And the mitochondrial inner membrane, you see the same thing actually. Uh, so it looks like a fairly universal feature of, of the helical membrane proteins. You can even look in, you know, when, when bacterial genomes were sequenced, you can start to look at all the membrane proteins in a particular bacterium. Uh, and you could look at the bias in the distribution of positively charged residues between outside and inside, uh, or any type of residue. Um, and what this slide sort of shows is that if you do this a lot across a large number of organisms, I think more than 100 in this case, this shows you the number of organisms in which, with very kind of crude methods, one could detect a statistically significant bias in the distribution of any type of residue from comparing one side of the membrane to the other. And what you see is that it's only lysine and arginine, or lysine plus arginine, that are biased in essentially all of these organisms. Whereas if you take negatively charged residues, for instance, aspartate plus glutamate, there is no bias. Or any other residue for that matter is no bias essentially. So, so not only is it true in E. coli or, or, or uh, you know, human, but it's seems to be true across essentially all, in this case, all bacteria that had been sequenced at the time when this was done. So it's a, I'm not sure if it's a completely universal rule, but it's almost a universal rule at least. Um, so positive charge distribution correlates with orientation. Now you can ask, does it cause orientation? Does it control orientation? which you would suspect, of course, because you see it in all these cases, but is that true? And indeed, you can experimentally show that positively charged residues control the orientation of memory proteins in the membrane. So here is one example where, um, with a very simple transmembrane protein, the simplest multi-spanning protein you can think of with only two transmembrane helices, um, but it's a bona fide E. coli protein, this one. It has two helices. It has a highly positively charged loop that is normally oriented towards the inside, towards the cytoplasm. It has a short end terminal tail that has no positive charge, and it's in the periplasm on the outside. And then it has quite a big domain here that contains both positive and negative charges, but it's very big, and so this rule doesn't really apply there to this big domain here. Um, so. It, the white type protein is oriented according to what you would expect with the positive charges facing inside. But then you can make mutants of the protein where you delete the good part of this loop, leaving only a short loop with only two, two, two positive charges. That mutant still orients like the white type with this slightly positively charged loop facing inside. But if in this mutant you then add four extra positive charges to this normally uncharged tail, and you make this protein, it actually inserts backwards, it inserts in the other direction, leaving this more positively charged tail on the inside and the less positively charged loop going across to the outside. And this has been shown in many cases now that, that you can, that basically positive charge is controlled Quality, or control orientation, I should say. And in fact, also to some degree, to quality, as I've shown you. Yeah? Does this affect the ability of the protein to double 
So does this change in like uh, the orientation affect these protein specific groups? Um, transport based, whatever is it specific? Oh uh, yes, the fu based the function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so this pro sorry, this protein here, it's actually a signal peptidase. It's a bacterial signal peptidase. It's the enzyme in E. coli that cleaves off signal peptides. Uh, and it has its active site in this domain here. And the, the cleave site in the signal peptide also appears on the periplasmic side of the membrane, so it can cleave it then. Of course, if you reorient it, it's actually not known if it remains active, but there is no substrates in here because the, the signal peptide cleave sites are always on the periplasmic side. So you would have to somehow re-engineer a signal peptide substrate to also appear on the inside to check if it's functional. Um, but there are other examples of proteins that have been turned backwards and forwards and shown to retain function in both orientations. But I, it depends on the function, essentially, if they do or not. Right? So. so here is the, the bioinformatics problem. Now, with this background knowledge about membrane protein structure, uh, what kind of, how would you design a predictor that takes reads in the sequence and outputs a topology model? Where, let's not worry about you know, the exact extension of these helices, but just try to get the number right and the orientation right, and not to be too far off in terms of the exact location of the, of the helices. Uh, so again, what, what one can learn from just you know, statistics on, on membrane proteins is that we would be looking for a segments of, say, up to 20 residues, mostly hydrophobic residues around not every residue has to be hydrophobic, but certainly the majority would have to be. Those would be good candidates to the transmembrane segment, helices. If there are tryptophans or tyrosines appearing at the ends, you should increase the score a bit, right? And finally, you would like the overall topology model to follow this positive inside rule. And if it does, you can immediately predict which which part faces inside and part faces outside. Right? So those are th at least three things that you want to have in your predictor. And here is just to show on, a, on, a, on a individual examples. Uh, example, the red is hydrophobic residues, and you see they are concentrated in these helices. Tryptophans and tyrosines in green, you see they're nicely located in the lipid head group region, and in this particular case, all the lysines and arginines are on this side, and there is not a single one on the outside, actually. So, this is a very kind of nice case, yeah. Sorry, Gunnar, is there any truth to this idea that I've been told that, um, that, that the positive inside rule has to do with interactions between the membrane protein and the ribosome at the time it's being inserted? Or is there some other mechanism that yeah, so that? There, so I didn't go into that, but how can it control topology? How can these positive charges control topology? Uh, so one thing, so it's it's not, it appears not to be just one simple answer, but there are a couple of different different features that contribute. One is, that it, certainly in bacteria, is the membrane potential. So in bacteria, and in most, you, at least the plasma membrane in eukaryotic cells, you have a sizable <coughs> membrane potential. Uh, and the sign of the membrane potential is such that in bacteria that the periplasm is, has, has more protons and is positively charged relative to the inside that's negatively charged. Uh, so if you imagine a stretch of polypeptide coming towards the membrane, or let's say, if you imagine a, let's say a stretch of hydrophobic residues coming towards the membrane, and if it has positive charged residues on one end and not on the other, you could, and it has to basically decide which way to flip in, right? The membrane potential would favor flipping the non-charged part or the negatively charged part across and retaining the positively charged one because the positive charges would go against the potential, right? And go uphill. So that's a very basic uh, aspect of the problem. And indeed, if you 
manipulate the memory potential in cells making memory proteins, you can show that the positive charges become progressively less important in controlling or, or less able to control the quality when you reduce the memory potential. That's one part. Then there is some evidence suggesting indeed that these positive charges might interact with negative charge RNA in the ribosome as they come out of the ribosome. And so the other end would be more free to move across the membrane. Uh, and there is also some evidence that the, the, the channel protein itself, the so-called translocon, through which these genes are inserted, uh, might also uh, interact preferentially on the cytoplasmic side with positive charges and allow, allow the less charged part more easy translocation across the membrane. But, um, but there isn't really just one clear answer. And in the endoplasmic reticular membrane, in <coughs> mammalian cells, where again, this positive inside rule has been shown to be, in, to be able to control topology, is believed not to have a memory potential. So you cannot invoke the memory potential to explain it in the ER. But it helps for prediction, I have to say. So uh, this is just to show you that this has been quite a popular field to do predictors, topology predictors. Uh, and if we start out with the bottom, these were these guys, very early predictors, even before this positive inside rule was, was known. So they only looked at the hydrophobicity <coughs> pattern. So they did hydrophobicity plots and tried to predict topology from that. Didn't work. There were too many false positive predictors or predictions and too many false negative predictions for, for the individual helices to get anywhere near it, the correct topology model for most proteins. Uh, then, uh, I'll talk about this one, TopRed, which was the first one to include the positive inside rule. And that was actually a, quite a big leap in performance, in topology prediction performance. And then there were a few more with multiple sequence alignments and neural networks. Uh, but all of these kind of medium old predictors were, um, had both the hydrophobicity and the positive inside rule. And then you have all the machine learning guys you see TMHM, that was, as Sam mentioned, but with others. TopCons is Arnas method. Uh, it's a consensus method, so it runs a number of predictors and tries to make a consensus prediction. That has become quite, quite popular. Um, there are new methods coming up. We do them you know, all the time as, as um, deep learning people get involved and so on. Uh, but I, the main steps, I think, would be, well, first, just the idea that to look for hydrophobic segments didn't work. Including the positive inside rule, then things started to work fairly well. And then with you know, all kinds of, of machine learning, things got even better. So those are, I, I would say, the three steps in this, in this field. So I'll show you the top thread method, because it's, it's, a, it's a pretty nice example of how just adding this idea of positive charges staying inside, in, in fact, improves your ability to identify the hydrophobic segments that sit in the membrane. And the idea is the f was the following for top red, is that first you make a hydrophobicity plot in your protein, which is, you know, essentially take a window of, say, 19 residues or 21 residues, place it across the first 21 residues, calculate the average hydrophobicity of those 21 residues, according to some hydrophobicity scale. And there are many of those, but they're all correlated, so you could take you know, almost any one. So you get a, an average hydrophobicity for those 21 residues. Then you move over by one residue, you repeat it, you get a new hydrophobicity for residues 2 to 22. Right? Um, and so you just plot this these running average as a function of position across the sequence. Here is a typical membrane protein, you call that membrane protein, and you see uh, so basically hydrophobicity, increasing hydrophobicity is upwards on this plot, just by definition. So you see there are some peaks, very high local hydrophobicity across the 21 residue window. So you would certainly guess that many of those are transmembrane helices, right? And then you see the travis, and those are 
correspond to loops between the provisions. Right? So if, if hydrophobicity was enough to give you the, to predict the helices, you should be able to define a cutoff where every transmembrane helix, every true transmembrane helix would have a peak above the cutoff and all the false, you know, everything else would be below the cutoff, right? And this would work for every protein with the same cutoff. And it doesn't. And that's why just hydrophobicity isn't enough. So nobody was able to come up with the scale and the cutoff or some variation on, you know, how you do the windowing. Uh, that would give you one clean cutoff value that would give you correct predictions for, for all the transmembrane helices and, and clearly distinguish all the, the ones that do span the membrane from those that don't. You would always end up either with you know, too many false negatives or too many false positives when you just have a single cutoff. So with TopRed, the idea was to use the positive inside rule to help you solve that problem. And it was done in a very, very simple way. And the idea was to, to use two cutoffs. One cutoff, yeah. up to one, and you push that high enough that you know from looking at many proteins that all the peaks that are above that upper cutoff always, or say 99% of the time, correspond to the transmembrane helices, right? Of course, you miss some, those that are not hydrophobic enough, but you take care of those with a lower cutoff that you push down far enough that any peak below that lower cutoff across a large number of, pro of proteins for which you know the topology, any peak below that would never be a correspond to a transmembrane helix in your, in your sample. So then you take these two cutoffs, you apply them, and you see in this particular case that you have, I think it's 11 peaks that are up to, or above the upper cutoff, upper cutoff so you see the 11 helices at least, and then you have one peak that's in between. And so that peak either could or might or might not be a transmembrane helix. You can't tell because it's below, it's between the two cutoffs. So you cannot, from your statistics, you cannot tell whether this should be or should not be a transmembrane helix. But you can conclude that, okay, it has a minimum of 11 and a maximum of 12 helices, given this particular hydrophobicity plot. Of course, you could have more than one peak in between, and then it, you know, the number of possibilities increase, right? But <clears throat> so then how do you choose 11 or 12 in this case? You use the positive inside rule. That was the idea. So you make both models. Here is the, the, the 11, and here is the 12 TM model. Uh, the, the dark bit here is this segment, so it's either outside the membrane or it's crossing the membrane. And then you choose between them by just counting the positive charge residues in the respective loops. So those are the numbers here. There's two positive charges here, one there, three there, and so on. So you look here, okay, more on the inside, more on the inside, more on the inside, more on the inside, until you get to here, and suddenly it's more on the outside than on the inside. So it doesn't look so great, right? But in this model, it's fine all the way. It's more positive charges on the inside all the way from the N-terminus to the C-terminus than it is on the outside. And the net bias is 9 here and 17 here. So if you have to put your money on one, you will put your money on this one, right? And in this case, it's the correct one. So, so that was how the positive inside rule was used to improve the quality prediction. Uh, and of course you get for free, you get the orientation as well. Right? So you would say this must be the inside, this must be the outside. But the positive inside rule actually helps you to predict whether this is or is not a transmembrane helix. So that was the idea. And this made it made topology prediction useful. It wasn't you know, super super good, but it was much better than just using other publicity alone. Um, and show that you know this is a, a tractable problem somehow. Uh, and then, like in the signal peptide thing, machine learning came into the picture, uh, and TMHMM was one of the, and actually Eric Sandhammer, who I think had just come back from a postdoc at that time, uh, was involved in this work as well, together with Putin and Denmark. And, uh, so 
the idea was to, to go out a hidden model, model architecture and then basically train it and try to make it predictive. So, so, um, so the architecture that was implemented in TMHMM was like this, basically said that, well, transmembrane helices, for all we know, they seem to have a kind of a central segment that has just typically hydrophobic residues. Then they tend to have caps on either side that have tryptophans and tyrosines, for instance, in them. Um, then they go into loop states, either on the inside of the cell, between two helices, and it could be a loop, a short loop, in which case you would expect, if it's on the inside, you would expect a lot of positive charge residues. It could be a large globular domain on the inside, and then the positive inside really doesn't really apply anymore when it becomes big globular domains. And same thing on the outside, you could have short loops, should not have any positive charges in them. You might have longer loops, or you might have globular domains. And, uh, yeah, so there was some fine modeling on this side here. But this basically was to try to capture what was known about memory building topology at the time, right? To go out an HMM model that would you know, and capture that. Uh, and then, of course, each of these states were bottled. This is the helix core state, for instance, where you have to allow for different lengths of the hydrophobic segment. And that was modeled by states where the first two states, you could just go from one to two to three. But then from three, you could go to four, or you could jump to five, or you could jump to six, or you could jump all the way to 24. So there are transition probabilities involved in all these cases, right? Uh, so the shortest would be three plus two more, so that would be five. You could model a, a, a hydrophobic core as short as five residues this way, or one that goes up to 25 residues. So that's how you could model it, but of course you have to optimize the transition probabilities from the training data. And here is a typical loop model where you know you come from the cap state uh, and then in order to model loops of different lengths, you could you know, go to one and then immediately back to the next cap state. So that would just be a one residue loop, essentially. Or you could go all the way to here and all the way back, so that would be a 20 residue loop. And you can get whatever in between. So, uh, so this, this was the basic way that TMHNM was set up and then trained um, over some training set of known topologies. Uh, and this worked quite well, actually. Uh, and eventually, like I showed you, many methods came online. And Arne, uh, who likes to make consensus predictors, um, set up Torcons. I think this early one, I don't remember how many now, but I think probably five or six of these individual predictors went into Torcons. And then they put a neural network on top to weigh the, the outputs from the different and go coming predictors, right, to get a consensus output. And this is still, I think, very highly used, actually, uh, by the community. Here is the typical output from TorCons. This is one with, where you have five individual predictors that come in. Um, and basically, so you can see the prediction for each one. So if you get a plot like this, you feel pretty confident, because they will give the same number of helices. They will say that the N terminus is on the outside and the, N the C terminus is on the inside. So if you see something like this, you would be fairly happy. See, it's a fairly reliable prediction then because all the methods give the same answer. And then you get some output in terms of, of, of you know, the, the basically hydrophobicity plot, this blue one. Um, so you can match it up and see that. Which, which helices are you know, potentially more problematic that are not quite as hydrophobic as the other ones. And so, so this is very useful uh, and, and, and quite performs quite well. <coughs> so then you could ask how good are they? And it depends a bit on where your protein is from. If it's a bacterial protein, they tend to perform best. If it's a mammalian protein, they tend to perform, perform fairly well. If it's a yeast protein, for some reason, yeast is the most difficult one, or fungi. 
and I don't know why, but the hydrophobicity patterns are not so clear cut, the charge differences are not so strong. Um, generally speaking, yeast is either yeast is very sloppy and makes a lot of kind of incorrect topologies that they then degrade in, the, uh, in real life, or there is something about the way yeast integrates these proteins into the membrane that we haven't been able to understand. I think it's the same with signal peptides, actually. These signal peptides are more difficult to predict than, than bacterial ones or remaining ones. But if you take bacteria, for instance, I think this is for bacteria. If you just ask something like TMHM to tell you whether a protein is, an, is a membrane protein or not, and basically you say, well, if it's one predicted transmembrane helix or more, I say it's a membrane protein. And if I don't predict any transmembrane helix by TMHM, I say it's a soluble protein. And that's a very, you know, that's a very easy task. So both sensitivity and specificity are very high on that type of prediction problem, at least for bacterial proteins. So you can definitely take the newly sequenced bacterial genome, you know, translate all the proteins, and run this, and you will be, you have a pretty, very good idea of which proteins are in the membrane and which are not. Then you ask, okay, so out of the membrane proteins, how often do I, or out of all the proteins, how often do I get the right topology? Meaning, the right number of transmembrane helices, they can't be too far off from you know, the real ones, um, and the right orientation. How often do I predict that? And the answer is if you just have a single sequence predictor, one that doesn't take homology into account, but just takes the single sequence, then you're right with TMHMM, you're right up to 75% of the time or so. So for three quarters of all the pro membrane proteins of all E. coli, TMHMM will give you the right topology. And there, there is a good correlation between the score you get out and, web, and, and, and the reliability of the prediction. So it's a, if it's a high scoring prediction, you can be even more confident that it's correct. Now, of course, these methods have been also expanded to take multiple sequence alignments into account, and that improves performance by 10% or so. So if you take your, your E. coli membrane protein, you do a blast, you align it to, to the hits, and you then do a, a, a prediction on all these proteins at the same time, uh, then you improve prediction performance quite a bit. So, so in that way, maybe you know 80% or so of, of your predictions will be correct. You can improve it even more if you know has a if you have a little bit of experimental information, if you can somehow determine, say, whether the C-terminus of the protein is on the outside or the inside. That extra piece of information, you can in incorporate that into the prediction method. You can constrain TMHMM, for instance, on the web page to say C-terminus inside. And then it will only give you predictions with the C-terminus inside. And that will actually increase predict, uh, uh, the performance quite a bit again, I think by sort of like 10% or so. Um, so tiny amounts of experimental information, even tiny amounts, can be really helpful in this game. OK, beta barrier proteins. Uh, of course, people have tried similar approaches. And here's one HMM type predictor for beta barrier membrane proteins, where you see, again, they have these transmembrane extended beta strands now. So every second residue is different, right? So there are dark gray states and white states, and they are different, right? So the, the, the underlying amino acid frequencies are different in the white states than in the, than in the gray states. So maybe the gray, gray states are the ones facing outside, so they will mostly be hydrophobic residues, and the white states are facing inside the viral. They could be pretty much anything. And then there are, you know, there are loop models and, and start and end models. So. The funny feature of beta barrier memory proteins, which incidentally in E. coli don't sit in the inner membrane, but in the outer membrane. So E. coli has two membranes. 
The helical proteins you find in any membrane, in the beta barrier proteins in the other membrane. <coughs> and the funny thing is, about the beta barrier proteins is that they almost, I think there's maybe one ex exception or so, they always have both the N and the C termini on the inside of the membrane. Whereas with helical proteins, you can find everything. You can find N terminus inside, N terminus outside, C terminus inside, outside, and any combination. Although there are preferences, but, but with beta virus, it's almost completely N terminus and C terminus inside the membrane. For reasons that are not really understood by the cell. <coughs> so, the last bit I'm going to say, and I'm sure you've seen this already when it comes to predicting three dimensional structure of globular proteins, is 3D structure prediction of membrane proteins. Uh, and what really has you know, made a big step in this 3D structure prediction is evolutionary covariation. And I guess you must have heard about evolutionary covariation from Arne or somebody else when it comes to global, from you, yeah. So this has been, um, this has been used also in me the memory protein field and it's worked really well. So you know the idea, you do large multiple alignments, you find the correlated mutations, and then you have to do some fancy statistics to figure out which are really reflecting uh, close proximity of two residues and which are just indirect correlations, right? But once that problem is solved, this turns out to be as useful for membrane proteins than that as it is for, for globular proteins. The drawback, of course, is that we need quite a lot large number of homologs in order for this to really work. But at least the bacterial proteins, this is not really an issue anymore, right? Because there's so many genome sequence. Um, so there, there are now quite a number of studies that have shown very impressive performance of these, um, all these structure prediction approaches on the, in the memory protein field. And here are some examples of, you know, I forget which is experimental and which is predicted, but you see they, they overlap, you know, surprisingly well for, for these proteins at least. Um, I think they usually also use, um, they add not just the evolutionary cooperation, but also predictions of, of where are the transmembrane helices roughly and so on to make it even better. So topology prediction still has some, but not no longer some important role to play, but, but it's still useful to add to improve the uh, these three-dimensional structure prediction efforts even further. <coughs> so this is really, you know, at, at the point now where, where it is, at least for, these, well, even for quite complex membrane proteins, where, where you can really get a good feel for the 3D structure from these co evolutionary correlations. Uh, there are some things still to worry about, is that some of these proteins are transporters that where you, I think this one, for instance, where you have like two domains, you can see them like this, right? And they will accept substrate uh, in the cleft here. Then they will close up on the substrate and they will then open up to the other side and expel the, the substrate to the other side of the membrane. Uh, so, they have, so, so they have quite distinct conformations depending on whether they're facing out or inside. And this is difficult to pick up, of course, with this evolutionary covariation because residues that are involved in close interactions in this state will score high, as will residues that are involved here, but they're never involved at the same time, right? Um, and this is hard to, you know, to figure out. So if there are large conformational changes, you, you, know, you either get one or the other, or you get some kind of intermediate thing. So, uh, now, so 